Jim City County and Supreme Mayor Pons, thank you for having us and uh, hosting us here. We're really excited to join uh, City Council and the Board of Supervisors uh, to present the superintendent's proposed capital improvement plan. Uh, we're really excited about uh, what uh, is about to be revealed. No real secrets or surprises. I think that uh, much of what we're about to um, discuss has been uh, discussed over the few years that we've been meeting together. And so I think it uh, lines up with our, our shared goals for the community and the school divisions. Uh, with that, I think maybe we can call the Williamsburg James City County School Board meeting to order. Uh, Ms. Otto, would you call the roll? Dr. Bierce. Here. Ms. Donner. Here. Ms. Hummel. Here. Mrs. Huntley. to present the superintendent's proposed capital improvement plan for fiscal year 25 through fiscal year 34. This morning, Ms. Ewan will present not only the proposed plan, but will, will, will provide context and background to the recommendations, including information on how enrollment projections are impacting the proposed capital improvement plan. Let me start with just a few facts, first of all. High school enrollment is projected to, re to remain fairly static. The renovation of the 900 building at Lafayette High School has been designed and construction is scheduled to start in June 2024. This will provide additional flexible space at the high school level. With the additional classrooms at Lafayette, we, will, we will remain around 90% capacity at the high school level for a number of years. Therefore, high school additions at both Jamestown and Warhill High School, formerly within the five-year plan, have been moved beyond the five-year funded plan. We will continue to revisit our additional space needs annually when we review updated enrollment projections. Growth at the middle school remains fairly static. Therefore, the request for additional classroom space to James Blair remains outside the 10-year plan. Currently, we have trailers at all elementary schools except Matoka, 13 in total, 26 classrooms. And Stonehouse has four trailers housing eight classrooms. If the construction of the pre-K centers were fully funded right now, the, the pre-K Bright Beginning centers would be on a fast track to open in the fall of 25. If fully funded in May 2023, they will open in the fall of 2026. Opening two pre-K centers will relieve the overcrowding of our elementary schools and allow 26 classrooms currently in trailers to be moved back into the elementary space. With enrollment remaining static at the elementary and the opening of two pre-K centers, we have moved the request for an elementary school out beyond the 10-year funded plan. The design of pre-K spaces is at its final stages. The two pre-K centers combined will serve 500 students, 100 more than currently served in our elementary schools. Of note, enrollment in pre-K bright beginnings this year is higher than it has ever been at this stage in the year, with the September enrollment at 377 students, with 79 in the eligibility process and 20 on the waiting list. We anticipate the likelihood of a new pre-K being fully utilized in the first year of opening. We're excited to open these spaces just in time 
We are grateful for our funding partners for your support of a dedicated, purpose-built space for pre-K to alleviate the use of trailers at the elementary level. And this morning, we're excited to, to show you some pictures of what that's going to look like. At this point, Ms. Ewing, our Chief Financial Officer, will take us through the presentation of the Capital Improvement Plan that focuses mainly on fiscal year 2025, our next funded year. Ms. Ewing. Thank you, Dr. Heron. Good morning, everyone. Each year, the school division adopts a 10-year capital improvement plan to project and plan for future needs and to allow the localities for adequate time and opportunity to prepare and budget for those needs. This morning, we'll be sharing with you a summary of the superintendent's proposed capital improvement plan for fiscal years 25 through 29, which is the first five years of the proposed 10-year plan. The estimates for projects in the capital improvement plan include 10% for architecture and engineering costs, 5% for contingency, and the cost estimates within the five years have been adjusted by 6% due to the current volatile market. A new project may appear in the CIP for the first time due to new or updated information, for example, updated enrollment projections or projects needed for safety reasons. Before I share information about the CIP plan, I would like to review our enrollment projections from last year in comparison to our current year enrollment. Our September 30th, 2022 enrollment was 11,308. Based on this, our projection for this school year ranged from a low of 11,224 to a high of 11,537. Our actual enrollment for this year ended up between the low and moderate projection at 11,324, which is represented by the blue line on the graph. An overall increase of 16 students as compared to last year. If you recall, for the last couple of years, our actual enrollment has been above the high projection, so it appears that enrollment has started leveling off from the increases we've seen the past couple of years after the COVID pandemic. This slide shows a comparison of our high school enrollment to the projection. Our September 30th, 2022 enrollment was 3,770. And based on this, our projection for this school year ranged from a low of 3,749 to a high of 3,860. High school enrollment increased by only nine students this year to 3,779 as represented by the blue line. This table shows Future Think's low projected enrollment as it compares to the division's capacity for high schools. Overall, high school capacity is currently at 95% for the current year and is expected to remain stable the next couple of years and then decrease slightly. The design for renovations at Lafayette are almost complete with construction expected to start this summer. The renovation will add an additional 200 to 250 seats of capacity, which will bring overall high school capacity down to 90% or less. Due to the various programs that high school students have available to them, such as New Horizons and Governor's School, all <coughs> students do not spend their entire day within the high schools. So if we place the classroom expansions at Jamestown and Warhill just outside of the five-year plan and fiscal years 30 and 31. We will continue reviewing this each year. <coughs> This slide shows a comparison of our middle school enrollment to the projection. On sep our September 30th, 2022 enrollment was 2,665. And based on this, our projection for this school year ranged from a low of 2,621 to a high of 2,697. We actually ended up just under the high projection for this year at 2,692, which is represented by the blue line. This is an overall increase of 27 middle school students as compared to last year. This table shows Future Think's low projected enrollment as it compares to the division's capacity for middle schools. Overall, middle school capacity is currently at 86% and is not expected to reach 90% until beyond the next 10 years. Based on this, phase two of James Blair would not be needed until beyond this 10 year plan. This will be reevaluated each year as updated enrollment data becomes available. This slide shows a comparison of our elementary school enrollment to the projection. Our September 30th, 2022 enrollment was 4,873. And based on this, our projection for this school year ranged from a low of 4,854 
to a high of 4,980. We actually ended up right at the low projection with 4,853 elementary students, which is represented by the blue line, and this is a decrease of 20 students compared to last year. <coughs> this table shows the elementary low projected enrollment with pre-K added. Overall, we are currently at 93.2% capacity, James River is at 97% capacity, and Stonehouse is at 107% capacity. All elementary schools have trailers except for Matoka to assist with space needs. The trailers are not reflected in the effective capacity in this table as they are a short-term solution to address space needs. You can see without additional space that elementary schools would remain between 93 and 98% capacity over the next 10 years, but design for the two pre-K centers is currently underway with construction expected to start this summer. Based on this timeline, there would be dedicated pre-K centers beginning, beginning in either fiscal year 26 or 27, which will free up space within the elementary schools. This table reflects updated capacity for the elementary schools with the current pre-K classrooms being utilized beginning in fiscal year 26 or 27 for a K-2 class, which would accommodate 20 students per classroom. Comparing this new capacity with the low enrollment projection from this year, elementary schools would be at an overall capacity in fiscal year 26 of around 84%, but will remain under 90% capacity through fiscal year 34. Matthew Whaley and Stonehouse will be over 100% capacity in fiscal year 26 when the pre-K centers would open and James River will be at 99% capacity. The division will need to go through a redistricting process in preparation for the opening of the pre-K centers. And based on these enrollment projections, elementary capacity will not reach 90% during the next 10 years, so a 10th elementary school is not included in the CIP plan. We obtained updated project estimates the year prior to anticipated funding from the localities. This table shows the increased cost for the fiscal year 25 projects included in the CIP plan. Estimates provided for any projects in years 2 through 10 are placeholders and may change because of natural economic forces like inflation, labor shortages, supply chain issues, or other factors that persist longer than anticipated. Cost changes for projects in fiscal year 25 from the adopted fiscal year 24 amount total 1.1 million as outlined on this slide. The design of two pre-K two pre centers is underway and we expect construction to start in late spring or early summer, but it is contingent on receiving additional funding. As part of last year's CIP request, we had requested <laughs> construction funds of 39.7 million but only 28.8 million was approved by the locality. The architect has provided us with an updated cost estimate for the two centers, which is 42 million. Based on this information, we are requesting additional funds in the amount of 13.2 million to be able to complete the two centers, which will help to alleviate space constraints at our elementary schools. And if you recall, we had estimated our fiscal year 23 surplus funds to be 9.6 million in September and requested that the localities dedicate those funds specifically to the pre-K centers in order to close this funding gap. Here you'll see some of the modifications to the 10-year plan, which include switching the Stonehouse and Matoka HVAC replacements to complete Matoka first, moving the centralized storage at the operations center from fiscal year 28 to 27, and increasing the funding request to allow for replacement of the fuel tanks, repair of the observation deck at Hornsby Middle School in fiscal year 30, LED lighting upgrades have been added in fiscal years 30 to 34, which was a recommendation from the recent facility condition report completed this summer. <coughs> In addition to these modifications, there are also projects added in fiscal years 32 through 34 based on the division's established refurbishment and replacement cycles for HVACs, refurbishments, flooring, roofs, and generators. Our CIP document presents projects by school, and this pie graph shows the breakdown by type of project. HVAC and window projects account for 37% of the total five-year CIP or 27.7 million. 
Refurbishments, roof replacements, and other repairs account for 14.2% of the total five-year CIP, or 10.6 million. Other projects include things such as refrigerator, freezer replacements, generators, and school bus replacements account for 27%, or 20.2 million. And new facilities account for 21.9%, or 16.4 million of the total five-year CIP. The superintendent's recommended five-year plan totals $74.8 million. And that concludes the presentation of the superintendent's capital improvement plan. I believe the architects are going to continue the presentation. Thank you, Ms. Huey. Now, Mr. Ke uh, Dr. Kiever, sorry, not Mr. Dr. Kiever, is going to introduce our guest this morning. Good morning. Thank you so much, Dr. Heron. We're pleased to be with you today to share some exciting news around the design for the pre-K centers for Williamsburg and James City County. Um, a group of our dedicated teachers and staff have been working with architects over the course of the last six months, and the excitement in the room has been palpable. In fact, yesterday afternoon, uh, there was a session looking at some of the finishing options and some of those kinds of scenarios, and it was difficult to contain the excitement of the educators in the room as they were touching things and feeling things and really getting a sense of what this will look like for our pre-K students uh, once it's constructed. Joining us from Blue Justice Upton Associates, Hay Evans, Don Lee, and Donald Parent are here. And then leading our presentation today from PK Architects will be Melissa Turnbull and Bailey Kimpen. So I'm going to ask Melissa to come on up. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. We're honored to be here and excited to share some of the work that we've been doing um, thanks to the wonderful participation with the school district. So I'm Melissa Turnbaum, a partner at PBK. <coughs> Bailey Kempen, I'm a principal at PBK. So we're going to go through a little bit of the process that we've been through and how, um, and then share some of the exciting updates um, and floor plans with you. So this is the typical design process that we follow. We actually start with, with the figures and the numbers, understanding the amount of students that we need to accommodate. Each, each building will accommodate 252 pre-K students. Then we change that into kind of bubble diagrams and a similar floor plan, and then we continue to refine. So right now we're in what we consider the design development phase. It's a refinement of the floor plan, starting to look at materials and finishes and what this building will look like. This is kind of a graphic representation of all of the different phases in the design process. Again, starting with the program, the budget, and then refining as we go forward. So we were honored um, to do a design charrette a number of months ago. This is a collaborative two-day session where <clears throat> we roll up our sleeves. Um, we were honored to, excuse me, to present um, what we're seeing across the country in early childhood. Um, what are the trends? Early childhood, you guys are trend setting because this is a major topic in, uh, across the nation. Um, you also are very unique in that because of the percentage of students that um, have neurodiversities and special needs, this campus will be able to serve so many of those students and be inclusive for all. That is unheard of across the nation. And so that's something that really came out of that. It's really exciting making sure that this campus is accessible to all. But we showed trends, we showed the importance of early childhood education, why natural light is so important, why outdoor learning is so important for their brains to develop at this young age. And then we started looking and, and doing site diagramming. You'll see some of these pictures where there's no bad idea. So teachers and administrators started to program and started to take the pieces that we had already established in the building program and start to understand adjacencies, relationship to the outdoors. And so it was a really collaborative session. We looked at strengths and opportunities of the current facilities. And with that, we created um, kind of a guiding principle. This, these are their words um, of things that are kind of our accountability score, of things that we need to make sure that when we complete this process and as we are making decisions in this process, that we are following this rule book um, and making sure that we are in compliance. Then we worked in, into schematic design. So we took the great work from the design charrette and the collaborative two-day session, and we continued to refine. We, we had um, more departmental meetings with the district to better understand the specific needs of each program, of each classroom. We started to understand storage needs and what you know storage needed to be built in, what kind of 
environment they needed to create, what special programs are need to be offered for these students. And so we did that through the schematic design process. And then now, in kind of the design development phase, that is the further refinement. So um, Mr. Kiever mentioned that we had a meeting yesterday. We're starting to make everything more um, real and tangible. So what materials are we using? We want to make sure that they're age appropriate for pre-K, but that we're also being good stewards with your and the district's resources. That we're picking materials that can last a long time, that are not burdensome to the maintenance and operations team, that are safe and secure. And so um, we're making and balancing those decisions. And so I'm going to pass it off to Bailey to talk a little bit about kind of the site and floor plan. So site plan, we can start with CBB. Um, we are planning to place the building based on the charrette and all the collaborative efforts that we went through with that. At the front of the site, along the main drive, I think there's a zoomed in option, yeah, with a bus loop and a parent loop that are separated for safety reasons um, and nice circulation on the site with staff parking and then outdoor play. For Norge, the, the building is at the back of the site. Um, there, the space in the back of the site lends, lends itself best to, for that building placement. There's some utilities and other kind of infrastructure areas that we're trying to avoid. So pushing it back to the site we felt was the best for this site. Then again, bus loop, um, parent loop that are separated, and then parking and outdoor space. Um, our playgrounds, so our courtyards that we've sort of enveloped into the envelope of this building, we want them to be, we're trying to stay true to our guiding principles, so accessible for all. Um, all of the children in the school would be able to access those courtyards, and there would be no, everybody can use every courtyard. So it's very inclusive. All of the, all of the things that the group from the Charette is wanting for this building would stay true, even in the outdoor play areas. The exterior design of the school, again, we're looking at materials that are going to last a lifetime, so state brick, cementitious panels, and then keeping the building at a very small scale for the kids. Um, so something that they're used to, it sort of has a residential feel, um, there's natural tones, and nothing is too high or overwhelming for them. The main entry, just, just a view into what you would see as you approach the school again with same materiality and then just keeping in mind the sense of scale that we need to maintain in order to let these kids feel comfortable. Perfect. So I'll tell, uh, talk a little bit about some of the interiors. So this is um, what we would call a typical classroom. So it's going to have flexible furniture, but going back to the charrette, it was really important that we had warm materials, you know, a lot of their time is spent on the floor, they want to engage with the building, and so we wanted to make sure that the classroom represented it. Um, you'll notice kind of different lighting. A lot of these kids, because of their sensory concerns, you know, typical lay-in ceilings and lighting is hard on them. And so we're really wanting to design this for them so that we have pendant lighting, a lot of natural light, so that they don't have too much glare. The buildings are oriented in such a way that we can really take advantage of that natural light plenty of um, storage, rubber flooring that is soft and acoustic, um, but also very easily cleaned. And you'll notice some of the kind of architectural character, again, mimicking that warm house, familiar um, uh, kind of feel. They have direct access to courtyards that are, as Bailey mentioned, enclosed and safe. Um, this is good from an everyday stance. It's also good for learning. Um, there was a study recently that mentioned that early childhood, specifically in kind of a, a public school environment, if students can have a very small learning environment where they have direct access um, outside, they're more successful because they're not spending their time in commuting between different facilities and different parts of the building. And so this is a great opportunity for them to have direct access directly outside. Um, lots of storage, cubby space, um, and then a lot of acoustical um, treatments to help this is the indoor play space. So it's a kind of a multi-purpose space. This, this um, space, again, to be good stewards of the square footage, it's gonna wear a lot of hats. This is where um, teachers can come together and collaborate. This is where on a rainy day, students still have space that they can um, get a lot of their energy out. 
Um, they can do physical therapy in this space. Um, it's also where parents can come for big presentations and you know, pre-K graduation. And so this space, again, um, is very flexible. Um, it's accessible, um, but allows them to use it in many different ways. And so with that, um, we, we appreciate your time. We are continuing to refine and move into kind of materials and finishes, um, continuing to work on the construction documents and specifications. Um, we've had great collaboration with the district, making sure that we're adhering to their, their guidelines and standards. And then um, our kind of proposed schedule right now, is, as was mentioned, um, we again are working on construction documents. So taking all of the, the imagery and, and making it more um, tangible and documented, we hope to proceed with a notice to proceed and construction to begin this summer. Um, as you know, with construction and timelines, early procurement on certain things, electrical gear, things like that need to happen pretty quickly in order to get students in um, by next fall. Um, I say 25, and so with that, we are hard at work to get that to happen. So with that, I say thank you, and I ask if you have any any questions. Thank you for for the report and sharing the uh, design process and the vision that uh, came through all the, all the collaboration. Um, before we provide questions, were there any um, last comments? Yes, we're very excited about the project. I think it's very forward-looking. I think it'll serve this community well. If you remember the Hamlar report that was commissioned by all of us together, um, there was a need for 650 spaces for early childhood in our community. And this really takes <coughs> spaces to another level. And actually what we're doing with the students to another level, we have a fabulous program, and this is a perfect space in which to deliver it to our, to our students. And this is the gateway for for success later in life. Thank you, Dr. Heron. So yeah, we'd like to open it up to uh, the bodies for comments or questions. I'm sure there are a few. Well, I'll, I'll start off if I if I may, um, and just uh, thank you for the presentation and uh, for all the uh, care that's gone into designing these these buildings. Uh, um, I just want to say that. Uh, I'm excited about the prospect of having a cutting edge facility or two facilities uh, in the community that will also help us uh, to uh, more effectively utilize existing space uh, for our uh, elementary school students. Uh, and uh, I, I think that uh, this represents a, a real opportunity for the community. And I, I hope we'll make the decision to move ahead expeditiously so that we can meet that uh, timeline of, uh, of uh, the fall of 2025. I think that it really um, would benefit not only our pre-K uh, availability, but also, again, give us more space, more breathing room in the elementary schools for some of the expanded services, some of the needs for classroom space, and to move those kids back into buildings. Thank you, Dr. Floyd. Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. <coughs> um, I've, I've been in support of this and, and, and think it's a, a good move forward. I have um, one concern would be the cost. You know, we've, we've um, and even in the presentation, we, we talked about budget and we're now exceeding that budget again. Um, you know, originally when we talked about this and I've been on the board now for 10 years and, and uh, we've been talking about this that whole time. I'm glad we're finally to the point where we're going to be able to put something in the ground and and make a difference, um, but I, you know, with the with the cost of it and what we've appropriated, plus the nine million that the school will have left, we appreciate that very much. Watching your budget and that sort of thing, um, it's still going to give us roughly about four million, I would think, somewhere around there. We're going to be short. All that both our groups are going to have to come up with an extra four million. Um, is there anything to look at in this process to change a few things to make some savings on that four million? And um, how would that be addressed? And is it, is it possible? I think every project that we, we go through, especially new construction, it does go through a process of value engineering at a point along the way. 
Um, I think some of the, the space, the classroom space is very similar to what we have for pre-K now, so I don't see much movement in terms of reducing that space, but we can we'll certainly have a point in time when we'll be able to look at every piece of this building and see what's possible. It's representative at its best and what is really needed. I'm always concerned when we start to think of a, a building and start to reduce what we think it will cost to do it well. Um, because I think of our, our middle school, James Blair, it's a beautiful school, it's a great school. It doesn't have a, an auditorium and students there right now travel to other auditoriums to perform and will do so until that school is eventually expanded. And, and so I'm always concerned when we start to, to diminish space that we really, really need to do it well. But certainly that is part of our process. It happens every single time and we will take a look at it for sure. And, and I'm not necessarily looking to diminish any spaces or cut down. Mm -hmm. Just look for any value engineering, any savings, and, and that sort of thing as we go through the process to, to um, you know, of course, it's always hard to find another three or four million dollars in budget. And as you all know, you know, dealing with your budget, what you have to deal with every day. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I do support the, the, the facility and, and all the things that are going into it. Um, but I'm always, you know, watching those pennies as well because, you know, once we get the building built, then we have to staff it. And, and I know with that issue, you know, I have some concerns there as well as far as the numbers I'm starting to see on what it's going to cost to staff it to, you know, because we're, I know you can't do dollar for dollar, but, you know, we're already supporting almost 400 students and add another 100 to it, but the cost I'm seeing for 100 is quite a bit. Uh, I'm balancing both of those because this will be, you know, um, you know, one ask of this and then another ask of staffing and that's why. So I've got to look at both of those numbers. But I do appreciate you getting all that information to us. But if I could just respond on one more thing, I know uh, in the course of this year we still do have ESSER funds. We're still using them for for various parts of operation of the school division, and we anticipate having some money left over at the end of this year. And I think there's room for a, a detailed conversation to see what we would need to have at the end of the year to allow this to move forward as soon as possible. So I know we gave back nine million last year. Um, if we have to work to make sure that four million goes back this year to make this move ahead, I'm sure we could. Thank you. Appreciate it. And Mr. Chairman, if I, if I could yes, add on to, to that. Um, uh, and I certainly appreciate Ms. Temple's uh, concern about to making sure we're aware of the full cost of both the operation and the cap capital construction. It would be helpful to, to maybe just get, get a refresher on the question that I think Ms. Ewing addressed uh, of the capital improvement projects that will be moved out beyond the five and 10 year uh, levels because that obviously um, gives us more flexibility than we would have otherwise had. Hey, Mr. McLennan, the reason for doing that is to really focus on what our, our current need really, really is and to look at the numbers and move major projects out to make this our, our focus for now and for the next couple of years. Mr. Yes, now? Um, yes. I, I guess one of the concerns I, I have with this is uh, we're doing these for 252 students each. Uh, so you're looking at just a little over 500 uh, total, which I think is up about 100 from what we're currently doing. But we still have a bit of a waiting list. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that, that what we're going to be opening with is going to be opening at, at full capacity and that I, I, I can see growth coming. So, you know, I'm thinking what's going to happen when we get open with these and all of a sudden the demand, uh, we started getting overcrowded in, in them or, or we have a waiting list where people can't come in. You know, they, when we first discussed this, the idea in my mind was to try to size the facilities so that we can accommodate um, future growth. It looks like the growth, future growth is already going to catch up with us. Um, so I'm, I'm just sort of cons you know, concerned and, and I just want to you know, throw it out there a little bit about what are the plans for um, how you're going to handle that? Uh, are we going to be looking at a third facility uh, at some time in the future? Uh, I mean, that, you know, that, that's 
of all the projections, I think the pre-K is probably the one that's going to grow the fastest. Um, absolutely. I think when we started this conversation, we were trying to accommodate about 650 students. We started with three potential sites, three potential buildings. We came down to two that were slightly larger. And really, all of those decisions were to do with potential funding to go ahead and make the first piece happen. I think it's like high school, it's like middle school, it's like elementary school. We'll be watching our enrollment very closely. And then when one the need is there, then I think we'll have to consider as a community um, another site potentially later on. Um, we use the two sites now. Obviously, these two sites are purpose built for elementary. So we've managed with extra land provided by the county, thank you, and CBB. We've managed to fit both of these buildings for 250 students. Uh, on a site that wasn't planned for two buildings. And so when we need more space again, we'll have to go back to the drawing board at the appropriate time and look. Also, we do have other uh, early childhood programs within the community. We have Head Start, and we have pilot programs who do serve many of our students as well. Dr. Heron, I was going to ask in response to that question with the, uh, the uh, wait list that we currently have and that we've always entertained. Uh, what's been the response for those that have been on the wait list? Well, I think the, the wait list is complex because we have to always keep spaces for special education students who may become eligible. So we can never fill fully to the maximum number at any given time. Even the numbers I provided earlier, they've actually changed. <coughs> that was the September 30th count. Just this week, we're 96% full. We've never been that full so early, and we now have 53 students on the wait list. They either will get into our program or else they'll have to find services elsewhere. That's why I'm excited that we've space for 100 more students. Uh, historically, we've, up, we've had up to 100 on the waiting list. We have never gone over that historically, but we certainly have filled up quickly this year. Thank you. I, I appreciate the uh, presentation and the thought that went into designing these facilities and uh, the opportunity to provide cutting edge um, space for these children um, you know, is something that we, we all aspire to and should be proud that we're even considering it. Uh, just following up on some of the questions, and certainly Mr. Eisenhower, I think particularly in terms of future needs, I'm reminded that the recommendation year or two ago was to build a new facility. Um, and, and I think that price was at about $42 million then. What was the the elementary, I think it got up to 60 million. I think it was 60 when, yeah. we, when we last talked about it. Yeah. So if we're looking at two spaces that are going to be you know, completed and then potentially in need for a third space, you're going to be at that $30 million. Um, I don't expect an answer from that, but I think that's something we should be thinking about. Um, so then I guess the, the follow-up question would be, with the construction of these two facilities, does that, how many trailers does that eliminate at the elementary schools? Is that, you know, Matthew Whaley, I think you said has four, there's several, they're all over the place. Right. Does this eliminate those trailers? Yes, basically this will allow every trailer currently on site at an ele elementary school, 26 classrooms, 13 trailers at elementary schools, all of those elementary students to move into the regular classroom space at the elementary school. Um, last year's projections, we would have been full and going to over full, but because enrollment has become static this year, we potentially will have space in our elementary schools for several years before we will need a new school. Ms. Kircher. Is that, is that the case projected at Stone House and Matthew Whaley, which looked like they were still going to be at 100% or more even when you were taking out? They will, they will be less than 100%, I believe, once because we were going to, we're going to redistrict. We must redistrict when we open the facilities. There, there's no pre-K in Stone House right now, and we're over 100% with four trailers, so all that population will be south when we redistrict the, the whole elementary population. The process, not moving pieces. <laughs> yes, that, that was a question I had. When do you anticipate, if you were to be able to do this schedule that you put up, 
when do you participate that the school board would start undertaking the redistricting process? Um, two answers, Mrs. Larson. Um, we either start next year for a 25 opening, or we start the year after for a 26 opening. If we have the funding in April approved, we can start the building, the construction, the process. We can get out to bid and get it underway. If we don't have funding until May, the normal process for approval of a CIP, then we're looking at a 26 opening rather than a 25. I just want to know when to turn off my email. <laughs> you understand. Yes, sir, um, Mr. Rogers. Thank you. Um, Follow-up question on some of the enrollments that uh, Mr. Eisenhower and Mr. Hipple were asking about. Um, so just a clarification, Dr. Heron, you mentioned 650 was the projection of the need for pre-K students within our WJCC school system. I know that these facilities, in addition to what we already have, would add capacity for 504. But you'd also mentioned the wait list this year is at 53. So can you help me understand the 650 projected number on what enrollment should be and why we wouldn't immediately see a much higher wait list <laughs> and potential for under enrollment? So the 650 came from a report from Adlar, and I think it looked across the whole community. Um, we do have students who are served within Head Start program, and we do have students served within private um, preschool as well. So with, with all three entities, there's the potential to serve all of the students in the community. All right, so that, that was basically total of pre-K aged students in the area, not demand for our yes, sir. opportunities, right? questions or comments related to the presentation? It's getting quiet on me. Now, is one, there one other uh, piece of information would be helpful to us? What would be the savings of the elimination of trailers at, at the school? Um, it would be helpful to kind of figure out the total impact. We can certainly get that up for you, Mr. McLaren. As you realize, the, the trailers are funded right now. The renting of the trailers is funded by the transfer grant which goes away September 24th. Um, and so we, there'll, be, there'll be addition to next year's budget to account for the addition of the rental of trailers next year. But we can certainly get you that figure and, and that's an important one. Are you, are you renting all those trailers currently? That's correct. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Dars, we, over a number of years, we've looked at renting and fine and we've found it more cost effective to rent because of the deterioration of the trailers have not been worth anything after a period of time. It might also help to um, just define for people that may not be aware, what um, for pre-K, what is your, who, what students are you obligated to serve in pre-K? <clears throat> We're obligated to serve those with, with special needs, um, but eligible students are have several at-risk factors that we actually serve with the program as well. And that can be a variety of different things, whether it's poverty, um, one-parent families, and several criteria that go into whether a child is eligible for pre k and, and so really it's 62%, um, I believe, right now, of our pre-K population is special education. And how do you, how do those students come to know about um, what your services are that you offer here in the community? We actually, uh, pre-K and kindergarten enrollment are actually advertised every year. Okay. We actually look for students within the community that need our services. Your child find. Thank you, Ms. Larson. First of all, I want to thank Baloo, Justice, and I like that name, <laughs> um, for their presentation. And the thing that really stood out to me is, you know, we always hear the comment, build it and they will come. Well, we know they are here, and they definitely looked at their needs and they're building around what the students need. And that quote that you all had up there about the appropriateness and the light and sound should be posted in the front of every building. That was just very powerful. And um, 
I mean, I can see myself in that space. I can see children in that space. I can also see some of us I, I, at the groundbreaking with our little hats and shovels or whatever you all do for photos when we break ground. But definitely, it's very inviting. And I know as uh, Mr. McLennan was uh, speaking, he said the word hope. And just we're in this season now, the Advent, and our first candle of lighting is this Sunday is for hope. And, you know, we're all familiar with if children are the hope of the future, then we are the children's hope. And um, we just need to keep the kids focused here. And, I, and they're worth every penny, every penny to see them in these facilities and sites. And I'm just excited and um, I'm just eager to be there when it opens and, and uh, to be there when the kids are in there. And I think it's just going to be something phenomenal for the community. So I hope hope that we uh, take advantage of this opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Ms. Young. Yes, um, I remember when uh, the Board of Supervisors um, brought this forward, and, um, and then at the same time, I think we were t talking about a, a new elementary school, and I, th I think for me that was um, Kind of a defining moment that, that 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 idea needed to be supported because we have so many special needs students which we are obligated to serve but in addition we have a, a large number of students that are at, at risk because of um, a variety of factors poverty um, many many other things and um, i i just want the board of supervisors to know that since that has come forward from you that i think many of us have have totally agreed that that's the direction and obviously the school division has also joined in that effort and so we're, we're asking that that it is fully funded because when you look at um, I'm thinking about parents with special needs children you know their, their dreams for their children are the same as as child, uh, families that have children that are without special needs and this facility will help those things to become more of a reality for for those families and probably the most important thing will help those students achieve those things that we, we all hope for children. Um, and I do want to thank the Board of Supervisors for being so proactive in, in this effort. And um, as a board member, I have appreciated that and I have fully supported that. And I just wanted to make that statement. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. We have uh, better than an hour remaining on our schedule. <laughs> We don't have to eat into it if we don't uh, hardly run the meeting. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Eisenhower. Um, but again, uh, another opportunity for final questions or comments as, uh, as we've been sitting here digesting the information. And uh, if there are further questions or comments after we leave, of course, we won't be as uh, transparent and available. I know Dr. Heron and her team will provide as much um, meaningful information as we can, we can in, the, uh, in the days leading up to hopefully groundbreaking on this really momentous endeavor. Um, Ms. Young talked about uh, a few meetings back and honestly leading up to today's meeting, uh, I, I too reflected on my first um, joint meeting with uh, many in this room and then my second one and those were honestly um, uh, somewhat disheartening meetings because Everybody in the room recognized that there was a challenge, a need in our community, um, especially at the elementary level. Uh, we all saw that. Uh, we all could agree that something needed to be addressed, but how, what's the best way to address it? Um, so as Ms. Youngs uh, mentioned, uh, I am grateful that through these discussions and the collaborative effort, we could come to um, a really meaningful solution. Um, yeah, there, there are challenges, there are questions of um, staffing and support down the road. There are questions of a, um, I think it's a 2.8, depending on how you look at it, a $2.8 million shortfall from what was originally requested by the school board. Um, but those, those are challenges to, to address and to um, uh, make accommodations for if we all do still agree that this is the best plan forward for this community. I, I do, and I'm excited for it. I'm excited for the families and the children that will be served, and I think we could all agree on that, too. I hope that we can. So I, I thank uh, PBK, our 
Architects is right in front of me, and Baloo Justice Upton Architects for being here and uh, for all the great work that you've done. Thanks to the City Council and the Board of Supervisors for being here and uh, helping us understand how we can um, answer some questions and uh, be more participatory, participatory in this as well. And to the school board for being here as well. Dr. Beers, you had a? Yeah, I just want to remind the board that <clears throat> Bright Beginnings began as a grant many, many years ago. And then uh, the school board and our governing bodies agreed to continue financing and supporting that program all these years. And I just see this as uh, an opportunity uh, to continue to uh, provide the necessary support. As the program has grown, it will continue to grow. <coughs> but uh, so from a, a small spot like that, that's where, that's where we are now and with your support. I don't think any, I, I certainly can't speak for my entire board, but I, I don't think any of us, I, I think we realize the importance of investing in public education. Our, our board has a long history of doing so, um, and I'm sure we will go back and talk about the numbers. It, it, it is difficult because it is where the rubber meets the road, and we have to produce the revenue in order to do those things, and our citizens, um, we want them to support um, uh, quality programs for sure. So, you know, we may have to turn to you to, to ask you to help us support that when it comes to going out to our citizenry. Um, and um, should, you know, be in towards um, raising revenue if, that, if it comes down to that. Um, but I, I think that all of us um, certainly want to do everything we can do to support um, Williamsburg James City County Schools and, and have a um, history of doing so. But I didn't want to um, leave the table today without thanking most especially um, Chair Dow, um, Ms. Young, who is the other um, the co uh, at Berkeley, um, Dr. Beers and Ms. Hummel for your service uh, on the school board. It's, it's been a pleasure to serve with you all. I wish you well in, in your future endeavors and um, you'll never forget the impact that you made on the children of Williamsburg, James City County and neither will we. So I just wanted to thank you for your service before you thank jump you. off. Thank you. of information for Ms. Lawson. I know that uh, in the hospitals when women have their children, CDR, it does, they have pamphlets about if you yeah. think your child has developmental issues. So I had a son that was in right beginnings because I was considered a geriatric mom. But <laughs> I, I was like, when they showed up saying, well, we're here to help you, I was like, what are you talking about? But, but CDR is a big help. So we need to make sure we check in with CDR because they know a lot of the information on children that might be coming our way as well. Thank you, Ms. Hummel. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for being here. We're going to go ahead and adjourn this meeting. Uh, we'll adjourn the school board. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McKay, would you call the roll, please? continue this um, meeting to December 12, 2023, um, the reception and the ceremony for and, and afterwards our regular meeting at the Government Center at 101 Mount Bay Road. Motion. Move. Move. Roll call, please. Uh, Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. McGlynn? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Aye. Thank you. Thank so you. Well, continued. Yeah.